I'm Ray Ashley. I'm the president and CEO of the Maritime Museum of San Diego, and I'm also a sea captain, and I'm also an historian. And one way or another, I've kind of been exploring the oceans uh, my whole life. The urge to explore is one of the most fundamental traits of humanity as long as humans have been around. And humans have been exploring the oceans for centuries. And when it comes to exploring the oceans, there's a whole bunch of special adaptations, obviously because it can be a hostile and a dangerous environment. Over the last 500 years or so, though, we have combined that urge to explore and the technological adaptations for going out on the ocean with science. And what's evolved is not a set of facts that science has produced, but a process for investigating the natural world combined with that urge to explore. So what I'd like to do is take you on a series of voyages of exploration on special kinds of ships. Ships which are not only capable of taking you from one side of the ocean to the other, but are able to take you into the past. And one of the things I think we'll learn is that the past is one of the most interesting and exciting places that we can explore. Hey, do you work here? Good morning, I do. Is this a pirate ship? Nope, not. But <laughs> I'm glad you asked though. Uh, why don't you come aboard and I'll explain about the ship that you see right here. Okay. Welcome, what is your name? Uh, I'm June. June Jamie. Welcome to the San Salvador. This ship that you're aboard was, is a replica of a Spanish galleon that was built in 1539 in what is now Guatemala, but at the time this is New Spain. So the ship set sail in Navidad in 1542. There were three ships. This ship is the flagship, so this would have been the largest ship of the fleet. Oh, wow. The other ships were much smaller and they provide opportunities if you're gonna explore the coast. So each ship is designed to be able to have different roles. And the San Salvador at this time in 1542, this would have been the most advanced technology at the time. A ship like this, what we look around, the masts, the yards and the sails, this is the, pretty much the most important part of technology for traveling the world. So they weren't looking for treasure? Treasure? What, it, what is treasure? Oh, you know how like pirates are always looking for like, you know, gold and like in that chest? Okay, like these valuables, gold, yeah. not exactly. Treasure in terms of knowledge. And the knowledge at the time was to be able to understand the Pacific Ocean. The only way to be able to do that would have been a ship like this. The treasure is going to be knowledge of new lands, new people, resources, as well as a way to get to Asia. Asia? Why would they need to get to Asia? Asia provides a new trade route, a new place for Spain to be able to expand their empire. How to get there, that's the big problem. Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo and these three ships are trying to find a way to get to Asia. They're going to sail north. Supposedly there's the Straits of Anion, a northwest passage to Asia itself. So before you said no, um, why does it look so much like a pirate ship? I distinctly remember saying, nope, but good point. So this is a Spanish galleon that we're aboard, is meant for exploration, for travel. The big poles that come up are our masts. Our poles coming across we refer to as yards, and on those yards are square sails. Square sails on the foremast. Why squares? I mean, I'm, a sailboat, they're usually triangles. And on the mizzen mast, there is a triangular sail, the lateen sail, and that sail helps a little bit out with turning the ship. How do you steer it? Where's, how do you, where's the wheel? <laughs> the wheel? Let me show you. It's a steep ladder. Okay, pirate ships can't be the only ships that have wheels, right? Baby steps. Technology takes time. So how do you steer a boat or a ship? Well, think about like a canoe. Canoe, you got a big oar off on the side and you're kind of steering it. Or a kayak like a paddle. Well, that's one way you could steer. And that's the first ship that probably had one of those. Then the next step is a bigger ship. You can't just use an oar anymore. You need something bigger. And just like a fish has a tail in the back, 
you need something in the back of the ship to be able to move it. So that's the rudder. The rudder is in the back of the ship. But how do you move a big heavy ru rudder to be able to move a ship like that? So this is a whip staff. This is what the San Salvador would have. So this is a up and down, a horizontal piece of wood that goes below. This attaches to a horizontal piece that's going back out to that rudder. By moving the whip staff, you're able to adjust that rudder to maneuver the ship. It would take about another 150 years of technology before they were able to make the advancements to have a wheel, it's a helm is what this referred to. And the helm is what would be able to turn the gears to accomplish the same thing of moving the ship's rudder. Would you like to see how the whip staff is operated? Yeah, sure, okay. All right, vamanos. Face the ladder. The whip staff we saw before is coming down to the tiller, which goes out to the rudder. And the whip staff is over here. And another viewpoint of the whip staff, you can see the large piece of wood here, so put your hands on it. Yeah, so you have your hands on the whip staff, excellent. And so in order to maneuver it, you might be either pushing or pulling depending what side. Don't look at me, look at where we're going. Everything's in the way. <laughs> That's a good point. That's the problem on all ships from the rear because we always steer from the back of the ship because it's as close as we can from the rudder. So where are we sailing anyway? I have no I have no idea. I told you already. What is the San Salvador sailing to? Oh, Asia. Exactly. Actually pretty cool. And and what what is that? This is the ship's capstan. Capstan? Capstan. The capstan is a mechanical device designed to be able to raise really heavy things. What shape is this? A cylinder. I was going to say circle, but cylinder is actually really good answer. Uh, this it's designed, the shape is designed to turn. The capstan rotates, but if you take your hands, you try it, see if you could be able to turn this and think you're going to be raising a thousand pounds. Nope, no, no I'm not, no I'm not. We need something for leverage. So over here are the capstan bars to provide that leverage. All right. Can you grab that end? Yeah. All right. And you could pass that right through there. No, 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 not, not that side. Oh. I'm just kidding, keep going. There we go. So then in order to raise something, you'd have a line. A line would be fixed to whatever you're raising. It would be wrapped around this capstan. Once it's in place, then the sailors would turn around and walk around the capstan, which would give you that leverage. So we're gonna be walking clockwise, so jump on the other side of the bar. There we go, and start pushing. Not Still difficult, but much easier than trying to go ahead and use your hands. Now, if they were using this to raise, let's say, the anchor, maybe they're doing this for an hour. An hour? Or two. Well, this looks pretty dangerous. <laughs> dangerous it is when it's used. This is the Bombardetta. The Bombardetta would be one of the ship's guns. This is over seven feet long and probably weighs uh, about the size of a small car. So that's the front end. That's the, uh, that's the boom side. This side is where you would load it. This would be lifted up and be placed in the charge. This would have been the explosive device to be able to fire a shot. And the shot would be about a five pound round shot. We can kind of feel that out. Bring it over to that side. The round shot would be loaded into there. And basically, once this is armed, this would be one of the most heavily armed ships of the world at the time. Can you fire this thing? No, I can't. But somebody else can. Run out the guns. How many people were on board the ship? 
there'd be uh, over a hundred people on the ship. A third of them are common sailors, the, uh, the marinero. Where would they sleep? But for the sailors, they're finding wherever they can, in the hold, along the deck. If this is an English muffin, any nook and cranny. Well, it would be a Spanish muffin, but you can't understand. There are others too, right? Oh God, what, what? A navigator too. Uh, how did, how did- Whoa! How did you do that? Shush, shush, shush. This is, this is really, this is really heavy. Can we, uh, can we do, can we uh, wear something lighter? All right. Oh, okay, that's much better. It is. Now the common sailors themselves, the Madoneros, they all had their own special skills. They need it to be able to operate this ship. They're coming from, they're sailors from all around the world. But inside the Alcazar, we could see where the other people happen to be with their tools as well. This bunk right here, this would be for the uh, ship's barber surgeon. So the barber surgeon was the one to be able to attend to the sailor's grooming as well as surgical procedures because the barber surgeon had the tools and the ability to use it when it needs to. Oh. This being a bone saw. Oh, that doesn't sound good. No, it's not. This would be used for amputation of limbs. You'd also have things like teeth pulling, bloodletting, basically any surgical procedures that need to be done on the ship would be handled by the barber surgeon. Other bunks that we have here include um, the pilot, the piloto, the navigator aboard the ship. The navigator would actually be second in command. The tolda, that would be the area reserved for the captain. It's furthest away, it's at the stern of the ship, so it is a little bit isolated from the rest of the ship itself. So Cabrillo gets the biggest room. He's El Capitan. All right, let's head forward. Whoa, wait. What, what? What's that? What does it look like to you? Well, I mean, I, I know it's food, but I mean, why is it here? This is a representation of the food and basically the critical resources that's available at, in the world at this time. So what we have here is basically old world and new world of food and resources available. This basket represents the fruits and vegetables and food of the Old world. So old world is referring to, let's say, Asia and Europe. So we have rice, beans, mission figs, grapes, coffee beans, fruit. Conversely, new world, peanuts, a legume a little bit different than some of our lentils. The beans, ah, the cornerstone. Corn and the maize. Avocados. Peppers, potatoes, nopales. Prickly pear. Not only is the pads themselves edible, but the fruits too. And inside here, this is the cochineal beetle. Whoa. When crushed, it produces a dye. Oh. And this dye was something not available in Europe at the time. So they would export this red dye for dyes for fabrics, lipstick, food coloring, and you'll find it there. So wait, why were they only in certain parts of the world? I mean, we can grow lemons and oranges here. Why were they only in the old world? Long ago, all these fruits and vegetables were very regionalized. They only grew in one particular part of the world. The only reason why we have it now, and it's kind of considered um, commonplace, you know, you go to any supermarket, you could see all of that. But long ago, it was very regionalized. No one had even seen it before. The moment of exchanging these goods, trading for it, bringing fruits and vegetables from the old world to the new world, and the new world back to the old world, this exchange is known as the Colombian Exchange. And basically this becomes the very first part of global trade. What did, what did the sailors eat on board? Because I don't think they could... No, they're not going to have this spread. And with all these fresh fruits and vegetables, maybe it, minus some of the, the rice and beans, it's going to spoil fast. So the key food for this common sailors would be those that can be kind of preserved on their own. Have anywhere from um, olives, mm -hmm. 
that are cured and oiled. Figs. Some oats. They would know they I really need to be put in water to boil it up. But aged cheese. Flattened bread. Crackers, if you will. If they might have some um, pigs or other animals, they might butcher that and dry that out. Oh. You're on the ocean, so what might, might be one of the easiest foods you'll be able to get? Fish. Absolutely. They'll either eat it raw, or they might go ahead and just smoke it. Oh. Sailor's gotta eat. Did people ever get sick here? Absolutely. Um, what can you probably, um, what do you need in about one to three days before you die? What's probably the very first thing you need to survive right now? Um, before I die, uh, water? Exactly, water. And so any chance of being able to have fresh water is the most important, you're absolutely right. Okay, what about in one to three weeks if you don't have it? What will you probably die from? Oh, uh, hunger. Exactly, starvation. So food, always something really critical. Now in one to three months though, you're gonna need vitamins. And one of the critical vitamins you need is gonna be, uh, we got 26 letters, we got the alphabet, got one chance. Give me a letter. C. Ah, first guess, vitamin C. Vitamin C, the body needs it. Without it, you can get very sick to a disease called scurvy. They didn't even really know about scurvy till much later in time. The one thing you do have is if you lack vitamin C, connective tissues, kind of what helps put your body together. If you get an injury or a, a cut or a break, you'll have a trouble, your body will have trouble healing itself. Ooh. And that could also, once in onset of scurvy, if you lack vitamin C, not only am I just talking about wounds and injuries, bloody gums, teeth falling out, blindness, even death. And so it's critically important to be able to have specific fruits and vegetables that had vitamin C in it to help prevent scurvy. If that's just lack of vitamins, couldn't that still happen today? Absolutely, and people suffer from scurvy as well as other diseases, malnutrition, throughout the world right now. Well, I mean, weren't things at least sanitary on board? I mean, what about the bathroom? That wasn't very sanitary either. Oh. Why are we going to the front of the boat? So, so where, where would they go to the bathroom? Both. All right, well, they use buckets, probably. Okay. Otherwise, they could also just go ahead and do their business right, maybe off one of the uh, kind of scuppers and the holes right on the side of the ship, or here at the front of the ship, where we are. Uh, come on over here, let's take a look. Um. Now, these slats here, this is to allow the ocean water, since we're at the front of the ship, to pass through the decks without putting too much pressure on the beak or the bowsprit. But since there are gaps here, like this is more way. than an ample space to go ahead and do your business here as well. And maybe when you're done doing your business, this could be just our form of uh, communal toilet paper. Oh, okay. they at least had like different ropes, right? No, just generally one line for everyone. They were probably wanting to get home, right? How did, how did they know how to get back home? That's a great point. Let me show you. Getting home, wanting to get home, well, really the big thing is how to get home. And at this time in the 16th century, navigation is essentially the most important scientific pursuit that is not only using mathematics, but important tools to be able to understand where you are and where you need to go. So one of those uh, tools used. Oh, the compass. Yeah, of I know that. Yeah. As the needle is always pulled towards north because of the Earth's magnetic field. Exactly. Now, normally we can just use our, our eyes to be able to visually look at or maybe feel where the sun is, or we can see the stars. And that could certainly give direction of, let's say, north. What the compass is able to do, whether it's nighttime, whether it is cloudy, doesn't matter the weather conditions or the time of day. 
this compass will always go ahead and provide a direction north. And this is kind of new because this is not using our own human senses. This is using a tool. Uh, like radar and GPS. But back then, they didn't have it. These tools that you're seeing over here would provide similar things. Now, they would not necessarily be able to tell you exactly where you are, but it would be the best tool to at least guide in that pursuit. These would allow you to know latitude, which can be able to have a little bit of help of where you are. This one in particular is an astrolabe. Basically any of these tools, the astrolabe or a quadrant or a cross staff, all work on principles of looking at fixed bodies in the sky, maybe it's a particular stars or planets, and getting angles, and those angles with mathematics are able to find out where your position is and where you need to go. Well, how much do they know about the universe? Well, they know about the sun, they know about the planets and stars, but one thing is they still had believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe. Uh, they call it a geocentric orbit. It wasn't until 1543 that old Nick Copernicus came out with his book to be able to show that it's no, it's actually not the Earth's at the center, it is the Sun. And the fancy words is geocentric versus heliocentric. So these are just the tools as examples that were used to be able to have that position, not only the tools to be used as the ship is sailing north in pursuit of Asia, but it also is your opportunity to get back home or in this case, maybe back to Navidad where they originally took off. So this has all been pretty cool, but you know, whatever happened to Cabrillo when he came back home? Cabrillo didn't make it home. Cabrillo died in the voyage. I uh, died uh, somewhere off what's now our California coastline. Um, the three ships did though. Three ships returned back to New Spain. Uh, they lost possibly up to half the crew. So he didn't really complete his mission, did he? They were able to chart this part of the world that at that point had never been documented before by any Europeans. So in a way, it provided information for other explorers, other sailors to be able to navigate the coast, to be able to better understand it. No, they didn't, maybe they didn't find that Northwest Passage, didn't get to Asia, and didn't, wasn't able to confirm or deny about the Straits of Anion. But that information in itself is important because this in a time is basically the entire part of the scientific process. Posing a question, using tools and instruments to try to answer a question and be able to document what you found. And in a way, this voyage represents quite a lot of voyages that happened at the time, a lot of pursuits. And these pursuits are not just on ships, but back on land. It is coming up with an idea is investigating it and coming to a conclusion. It's a basis of science. And that basis of science is not only so important in the 16th century, but it's still incredibly important to this very day. It also gave an opportunity for better and without a doubt for worse of also the experience of interaction of cultures. This Americas that we are at was populated by millions of indigenous people, their land, specifically what is now Southern California was populated by the Kumeyaay, the Chumash, other indigenous populations that were here. That had an opportunity for exchange of culture, but then again, it was also disease. It was also slavery. There was death. All of it is wrapped up in terms of what we considered for better and for worse, an opportunity to explore a new land and a new part of the earth. We've learned a little bit about what sailing was like in the 16th century and what it was like to go to sea on a ship like the San Salvador, keeping in mind that that was one of the most complicated objects people had built up until that time. We've also learned a little bit about what it was like to be part of an entire society of microcosm projected out onto the empty space of the oceans for the purpose of finding out what was there. And more importantly, we've also learned how the methodology for exploring the natural world began to be influenced by instruments, by numbers, and how that was reducing the natural world into terms that we could understand and evaluate, and how that process of science was beginning with a process of exploring the oceans. This is Ray Ashley from the Maritime Museum of San Diego, 
And I hope you enjoyed our voyage into the past. I'd like to invite you on future voyages of exploration into the story of how we learned about the oceans.